All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our little virtual event space. I'm Allie. Uh, I'm sorry that I kind of look like an airline pilot, but you know, it's 2020 and we do what we have to. Um, if you're local, you might recognize me from our LFP location. Um, I'm so excited to be introducing Marty Wingate and Hannah Dennison here to discuss the new mystery murder is a must. Um, before we get into the fun stuff, I just want to quickly thank you guys so much for tuning in, for buying books. Your guys' support really is what makes all of this possible, what keeps us up and running, and we love what we do. So if you all also love what we do, uh, we would so appreciate it if you bought some books. Um, we will be throwing the link to the website up in the chat over here. Um, if you're local though, you can just come on into the bookstore. We also have a curbside pickup kind of, you come in and we'll just pass through your book and you can get on your way. Um, or we do ship. It is only 350 and you also get to support USPS. So added bonus. Um, while you're over on the website, I definitely recommend checking out some of our other upcoming events or signing up for our newsletter. It is just one email a week. Um, a weekly update about the exciting new releases that are coming out, exciting events we have coming. We're getting to the end of this little season before the holidays, but we do have just a few more really exciting events in the next few days. Um, I definitely recommend following us on social media for the most up-to-date info. We are on pretty much every platform at Third Place Books. Um, and that'll be just the quickest recommendations and updates that you could hope for. <laughs> so uh, we're going to be here for about an hour. And towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we hope that you do, go ahead and throw those into the Q&A box, which is different than the chat box. Uh, if you do have thoughts, feelings, if you're coming from somewhere far off or close to home, we love to hear about that in chat. Go ahead and throw your opinions, comments, we love to see it. Um, and I think that's all the housekeeping I have. So without further ado, Hannah Dennison is the author of the Honey Church Hall Mysteries and the Vicki Hall Mysteries. She has been an obituary reporter, antique dealer, private jet flight attendant, and Hollywood story analyst. And after living on the West Coast for 25 years, she has returned to the UK to enjoy all country pursuits, movies and theater, reading seriously good chocolate and the company of some very good dogs. Um, Marty Wingate is a USA Today bestselling, much beloved local author whose books I put into people's hands all the time. <laughs> she's um, when she's not committing fish, fictional murders, she leads garden tours through England, Scotland, and Ireland as a member of the Royal Horticultural Society. Murder is a Must is book two in the first edition library mystery series. In it, our heroine Haley plans an ambitious spring exhibition with and with luck finds the best venue and the best, if the most difficult manager to put it on. Then said manager is found dead at the bottom of a spiral staircase. Uh, so thank you guys so much for being here. If you need anything, I will be listening in. Just give me a shout. And the rest of you, I'm going to leave you in their capable hands. Uh, so don't forget to throw your questions into the Q&A. And I will be back soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. It's good to know she's going to be there. Yes, exactly, exactly. So, oh, Matthew, yeah, I, Hannah and I thought I, we would introduce our series first. And so, Hannah, you go first. Okay, okay. So this is kind of very strange for me, too, because I feel like you and I are actually sitting across the table at a coffee shop instead of um, 5,000 miles away, mm -hmm. because I am actually in England right now. So, um, yeah, so I write, um, at the moment, I'm writing three, two live mystery series, the Honey Church Hall mystery series about um, a mother-daughter duo who live on a country estate in the West Country of England. Um, and the daughter is an antique dealer. Um, she used to be the host of a very well-known um, and fictional fakes and treasures like an antique roadshow. 
um, and her mother um, rashly purchased a, a part of the country estate and moved down to Devon from London. And she secretly writes very racy bodice rippers under the name of Crystal Storm. So that's her secret, um, which of course in the first book, her daughter knows nothing about. Um, so those are set in Devon, uh, where I live now. And then my other series, which is the Island Sisters Mysteries, is my new series. Um, and it's set in the Isles of Scilly, which is about 28 miles off the southwest coast of Cornwall. Poles out country, I always say, if everyone knows that. Um, and it's about two sisters. Um, I desperately wanted to call it the Silly Sisters, but the publisher, if he said, no, no, we can't do that. And they inherit a, um, an Art Deco hotel that's um, on an island, a causal, a causal, it's accessed only by a causeway. So it's sort of like a very much like a locked room mystery. And so these two sisters um, is about um, getting to know each other again because she, that one sister is a Hollywood um, producer weird hey because that's where I used to live in Hollywood um, and the other sister is recently widowed and she was a photographer so those are my two my two series and then as Ali mentioned I do have a third series which is like dormant at the moment um, and that's also set in Devon which is great that I've moved back here really um, that's my Vicky Hill mysteries and um, Vicky is a obituary writer who's stuck writing um, she wants a front page scoop but she's stuck writing the obituaries uh, for a very small local newspaper which is actually what I used to do when I was 19 so a bit of myself in every single book there so there you go so that's that's me in a nutshell so um, over to you <laughs> thank you Hannah uh, we we do like writing what we know for the most part, don't we? Yeah, um, exactly. I'm not sure if I've ever told you this, but when Leighton and I go over to England, which you know we usually do every year at least, and have well, that's another story. Um, we look forward to again. One of our favorite uh, television programs is Cash in the Attic. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. It's, yeah. yeah, I don't even know if it's on anymore. If it, it, it but yeah. it, now I think it's like storage wars or something but <laughs> yes yes anyway hi yeah. everyone i'm marty wingett and i am the author of the first edition library mysteries book two murder is a must is um out now book covers strategically placed over my shoulder here uh last year last year i had my book launch at third place books for the bodies in the library and there was a big crowd there and we had such a great time and so i'm so sorry we're not all there again this year but i'm really happy to be talking with hannah um we are we are creating what we should have done uh, in march in the cotswold yes. and, and oh, yes. scheduled to be at the Bybury book festival Bybury literary festival and yes. um obviously that got canceled and so we're not in the Cotswolds, but we're in the second best place, third place books. So yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> I guess we'll, we'll go on from there. Um, the first edition library series is set in Bath in England, and it concerns a collection of first edition and rare uh, books from the golden age of mystery, mostly the, the women authors. That's Agatha Christie, Dorothy L. Sayers, Niall Marsh, uh, Marjorie Allingham, a few others. And the curator, the my main character is the curator of the library. She is Haley Burke. Uh, she formerly worked at the Jane Austen Center. My agent, when we started talking about this uh, series, my agent said, do you want it to, have, because I wanted it to be set in Bath, and she said, will it be about Jane Austen? And I said, I don't think it'll be about, there's a lot about Jane out there. And yeah. so I yeah. sort of moved okay. Jane to the side. Jane Austen is always present in Bath. Um, so Haley used to work at the Jane Austen Center. And uh, then she got on as curator of the first edition library, which was a real lifesaver for her and for the society as well, because they were in a bad place. The problem is she has never read a detective story in her life. And so oh, that's that. how we open uh, the bodies in the library. So now book two, Murder is a Must, Haley knows a tiny bit more about detective fiction and mysteries, not all that much, but she can recognize some of the most important names. So when she comes across a draft of a letter written by Lady Fowling, this is Lady Fowling's library, that's the basis of the first edition library, 
Lady Fowling died three years before the bodies in the library opened uh, at the age of 94. She had a long life, very interesting, long life. And uh, Haley runs across a draft of a letter from Lady Fowling to Dorothy L. Sayers saying, thank you very much for giving me the first edition of Murder Must Advertise, Dorothy L. Sayers book, signed by all the members of the Detection Club. Mm -hmm. So anyone who knows anything about the golden age of mystery, the detection club is still around. We're not members, Haley. I, I, I mean, Hannah, I, I can say, but uh, other people are members and we know about it. It was quite famous and it was put together by Agatha Christie and all of them back in the thirties. So this is obviously going to be, this book is going to be the thing for the exhibition on Lady Fowling's life. The problem is the book is missing. Uh, and so it's the mystery of where's the book and the mystery of um, the death of a very important person uh, concerning the exhibition. That's uh, what Murder is a Must is about. And of course the title comes from Murder Must Advertise because I used this spiral staircase <laughs> as mm -hmm. the, the site of the murder. That's good. So, yeah. So. Oh, we're going to talk about setting. We have, we have, I have my little cheat sheet here. Hannah and I talked about what we were going to discuss. So uh, Hannah, I'm really interested in, I remember hearing a story about how you chose Honey Church Hall, created yeah. Honey Church yeah. Hall and the village and everything there. So I want to know about how you chose the setting for Honey Church Hall series and also why you chose the Silly Isles of Silly for the Island Sisters. Yeah, I um the Honey Church Hall was um it was really strange because um when my dad passed away, my mom was only I think she was only 72 or maybe 73. Um and she just just one day just went and bought the wing of a country house. She didn't tell my sister or myself. She just had always wanted to live down a long drive in a huge country house. But of course she couldn't she couldn't afford the whole house. So she just bought a wing of the house. Um, and we were both horrified because first of all, you know, it was, there was, it's on three floors. It was down a drive. You, you could, you had to have a car. And so she reinvented herself when my dad had, you know, passed away. Plus um, he was quite, um, he was quite, very, quite old fashioned and was very strict with finances and stuff. So my mom just went nuts and she had everything she wanted. She, she ran out of money in the end actually. So she doesn't live there anymore, but she lived there for 10 years. And so um, my sister and I were, we went to try and persuade her to change her mind, to sell, to sell it and to come back and live in a more reasonable place, but she didn't want to. And she had some very, very happy years there. Um, but I thought, well, that's an interesting concept. You know, you've got the, the mother who's a widow. I seem to have a theme with widows actually. Um, and the daughter who doesn't want, who, who sort of like wants her to start a new chapter in her life, but is also very worried about her. So um, next to this house, which exists, it's called um, Dundridge actually, um, in Devon, is the most beautiful carriage house. And it was derelict when my mom moved into the wing of the country house. And I thought, wow, that would be such a great um, place to set a story. So the, my, the mother now lives in this carriage house, which I actually made a little book trailer. Um, I think it's on Goodreads, if anyone wants to look, because it's when they renovated it, someone actually bought, bought it and renovated it. They kept everything. They kept all the stalls of the stables. Um, and so they just basically renovated where the grooms would live, but they kept the spirit of the place. Still the names of all the horses on the little tags, you know, and, and all that. So it, I love that. So that was really the sort of idea of, of choosing it. And then when I was when I was growing up, we used to live um, at the in some gatehouses at the bottom of the drive of a country estate. So um, I, I actually made that my antique dealer. She's going to carry on dealing in antiques. She deals in dolls and teddy bears, actually miniature houses, dolls houses, stuff like that. So I sort of incorporated all those things that I knew into Honey Church. And then the weird thing was that. Um, I couldn't think of a, a title because, you know, a lot of, I'm not sure, I think you do you share your titles? Because my titles are such a struggle for me. And my editor picked Honey Church 
she said, come up with some names in the West Country. So I went on a map and I actually just gave her five and she picked Honeychurch and I thought, oh, okay. And then it turns out that um, Honeychurch is a, a hamlet. There's only five houses there and it's in the Doomsday Book. And since I wrote this, I've had people who, um, who from all like New Zealand, Canada, who all have connections with the name Honeychurch. And so there's a sort of, I put them all together. So it was kind of fun because they, they, it was just like crazy. So you just never know where your books are going to end up, you know? So, um, so that was, that was the Honey Church series. Um, and then with the Island uh, Sisters Mysteries, um, my sister, I have a sister, um, she had a friend who was the human resources director for a resort called Tresco because the Scilly Isles there are five islands um, main islands where people live and then there's 142 little tiny little rocky inlets and stuff and she said that she worked on, on this resort um, it was like a little private island it's only like a mile long it's very small um, and she said people come to work on the Scilly Isles the seasonal workers because they're normally running away from something or hiding from someone and I thought, oh, I like that. I like that concept. Um, and so I, I stole that. And, I, and then I invented an island because I didn't want to offend anybody in the, or have murders. Because people go there on holiday all the time. Um, and um, so I created Tregaric Rock. And Tregaric is um, a mixture of um, Tresco, uh, which has got a beautiful climate. It's like the south of France and everything. Um, and Burr Island, which I know you'll know because Burr Island is in Bigbury in Devon, but it's where Agatha Christie, um, she often went to write, Golden Age um, writers would go there. And it's at the end of a tidal causeway, which is so I picked that hotel up and stuck it. This is so great. I can, you know, it's what doing, doing a writer, you can just like think, oh, I'll put that there. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was also where, um, and then there were none, was filmed on Soldier Island. And so they sort of picked um, Burr Island, um, which you can actually go to for um, and stay when COVID lifts. And it, they've kept it all 1930s. So there's no t TV in the room and you go down to dress for dinner and all that. So I kind of borrowed that idea for my, for my uh, Art Deco Hotel which is actually when it, the book starts, the first one, Death at High Tide, when they first discover that they've got this hotel. Um, it's all set in, uh, it's all kind of furnished in 1970s horror. <laughs> so, so I have, because I remember that really well. So that's, um, so the two sisters, you know, um, they're also getting to know each other again, because um, Evie Mead, the main character has lost her husband and Margot's just got divorced. And so she's moved back from, Los Angeles and so in a way it kind of paralleled my relationship with my own sister too so it's been um, something a theme I've noticed nearly in all my books is this reinvention starting a new chapter so so that's those are my settings um, but I, I want to hear about Bath because I'm embarrassed can I tell you I have never been to Bath oh my I have oh. never <laughs> I know not because I don't want to. I've yes. been to Tunbridge Wells, supposed to live in Royal Tunbridge Wells. Oh, yeah. So that's also another spa town. But I know that Bath is like a gazillion times more beautiful than Tunbridge Wells. Yeah. I, I do love Tunbridge Wells. And we stayed near the Pantiles last yes, time. We I did work in the Pantiles, actually. Yeah. yeah. And actually, book two in um, the Potting Shed series is uh, set in Sussex, very near. Oh, really? Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. I love because I, I lived in Sussex for about 12 years. So. Oh. Yeah. Well, so um, yes, Bath. So this this is how I, I chose Bath to uh, for the first edition library uh, because I have two previous series that are uh, in ebook only, and the Potting Shed series is about Prue Park, an American gardener who moves to England. And in that series, it's funny because um, uh, often people talk about uh, cozy mystery series as one of the rules as it if you know, we need rules, uh, is that they're all set in little villages. Well, a, a village can be anywhere. It can be in a city. It's just yeah, a small exactly. group of people, a community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, in the Potting Shed series, Prue hops around Britain a fair bit. It starts out in London, and then it goes to Sussex, and then to Edinburgh, and that, you know, each book has been, she's kind of settled in Hampshire now. Um, 
in book two in the bird uh, in the second series birds of a feather that set in suffolk and there i uh made i chose a real village and i made up a new name for it and strangely enough i've discovered that there's another mystery writer connie berry who chose the very same village i did and oh. made it something else and so we and both have Series said in Long Melford, that's where, um, and we've stayed in Long Melford many times and we just love it. And the first time we got there, everybody talked about Lovejoy. Oh, well, you've seen Lovejoy. And we had oh, never it. seen the Lovejoy oh. series. Yeah. It, for anyone who hasn't seen it, um, it's absolutely fabulous. It's it's a really funny series. And about yeah. things. So then along came the third series and I was talking to my agent about it and I said well I'd like it to be set in Bath because one of the things we need to do if we're going to start if we're an author starting a new series is to make it different from yeah. there, there are always themes and I I'm sure I have the same sorts of themes in in my series too but you know you don't you're not going to have the second series set at Honey Church Hall unless you know it's a minor character yeah. that's taking yeah. over. So I um, we've been to Bath several times. We love staying there, and so I thought this would be really fun because it's a, a part of the country. Prue's never been to Bath. There's never been a book set in Bath, and of course Suffolk is far enough away. Um, and there is. So the the city is beautiful. The city is quite popular with tourists and tour buses and students. Um, but there you can still, at the end of the day, it, when it gets a little quieter, it's still a lovely city to walk around. The Royal Crescent is gorgeous. Yeah, yeah I've seen pictures, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. And, and I have, we had tea in the, now this was totally research we had tea at the royal crescent hotel we had to because it was, in, not, exactly. <laughs> we heard that. Yeah. it was in the bodies in the library so i had to do it um and so then my agent asked about jane austen and i thought no 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 and and came up with um the first edition society and its library as the main thrust of the book so middle bank house where this is held is is in um one of the georgian terraces uh in Bath and probably if someone knew Bath really well, they could figure out what street this was I'm talking about. I don't actually name the street, but I name everything else. It's one of those times when sometimes we make everything up um, in a book and sometimes we don't. And Bath is really very much Bath. In fact, someone- I do definitely, I find that your descriptions of Bath are so, so accurate. I haven't been there, but I know that you know Bath and I think that's really important. So you're writing as someone who knows the city and that really definitely comes across. And I, I really like that about that. Yeah. I, I, and I like being able to, I, I like to think that somebody could read the books and then find their way around Bath. And actually yeah, someone has, exactly. who's been there has said, oh yeah, I know that. And, and a couple who came to a, a library appearance last year, uh, said to me they hadn't they were buying the bodies in the library but they hadn't read it yet oh we love bath and our favorite pub there is the raven the raven the raven is in the book the raven is always in the books so i have all the real pubs except for one that i renamed yeah there's, i was going to ask you about that one yeah, yeah. There's, there's a little tiny pub on northumberland place called cour de leon and uh i renamed it the minerva because i wanted that nod to the romans and so um that otherwise it's the very same tiny pub in the same place and Cause, yeah because sometimes as well that you know if you if you're so accurate then sometimes it doesn't you, you it's difficult to sort of spread out a little bit more fiction you know because someone might say oh that's not right the bar is in the other side when you walk in or something yeah, that's right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. um Oh, the other thing, so for Murder is a Must, the thing that is created, so it's mostly still just the way Bath is, um, Middle Bank House is not far from the assembly rooms, and yeah. I needed a place for uh, Lady Fowling's exhibition, the Lady Fowling, A Life in Words, um, yeah. and uh, really, in reality, I there was no place in the city. There's a room at the Guild Hall, the assembly rooms let space out for special events, but they're one day special events. And I needed something because this exhibition is going to be about a week and a half. And so I, I made that up and I made it up right across the street from the assembly rooms. There's a corner um, 
And I, really, I think these people should turn their, their house into an exhibition <laughs> space now because I just made it so that it's perfect. So that is made up, um, but everything else is real. But I did want to um, mention, I, I want to go to that hotel that you were talking about where Agatha Christie and all the others went. Oh, to Bar Island, yeah. yeah. Bar Island. Um, it reminds me that last year, uh, when Leighton and I went to England, uh, we met Hannah at uh, Malice Domestic, which is a fan convention uh, in Maryland every year for traditional and cozy mysteries. And we said, oh, we're going to go over and we were going to be in Devon. And we thought, oh, this is great. We'll, we're going to see Hannah, who's not far away in Totnes. And she said, where are you staying in Devon? And I said, we're staying in Pangton. And she said, why? Yeah. <laughs> well, it used to be, it used to be, um, it used to be in, uh, on the Riviera in Agatha Christie's day. It, that part, that whole seafront was just really beautiful. Yes. I mean, yes. But it, it has actually gone down a little bit. But you you picked a very traditional old boarding house type, didn't yeah, you? Yeah. Yeah. It was just like a it. and it faced the water, and it was just fine. But we we understood what you meant when we oh, got. Did, did it smell of onions and stuff or not? No. 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 Okay. Just, sometimes it, they do. You smell of onions. <laughs> It was so funny, but the little the town was just fine. It had a lovely seafront walk, and we yeah. found a little hole in the wall Italian restaurant that was absolutely fabulous. And I hope he's still there when we go back. Oh, right. The reason we stayed there is that we could uh, book a taxi and go to Greenway. So, oh yeah, well, yeah. Home, I had to because, of course, the body's in the library, and so I was snapping pictures of of the book cover in front of the library and in front of Greenway and uh, and next to the big cream tea that I was having. And uh, so that that's why I know that there's a lovely um, steam train you can take there, but. Yeah, they do the the round robin where you also come back on the on the river. But yes. my, my mom is, um, my mom's a docent at Greenway. Well, was, she, obviously it's closed. You know, yeah. But Yes. Ever since it's been open, she's been, um, you know, there with the National Trust. She's like works for the National Trust. And um, so it was I always found that if ever I got stuck on anything in my writing, she would just say, well, Agatha says this and <laughs> Agatha says that because she was she knew everything about Agatha Christie. She knows yeah. everything about her. Well, so. that was, and I'm sure your mother did it in a very kindly way, but it does rather remind me of Mrs. Woolgar. Um, the oh, I love Mrs. My book one of my favorite characters in your yeah, book. Yeah. yeah, so Mrs. Woolgar is the secretary for life uh, mm -hmm. with the First Edition Society. She was the personal assistant of Lady Fowling for many yeah. years. Haley is not sure how many years because she can't get any information out of Mrs. Woolgar. She doesn't know how old Mrs. Woolgar is. She doesn't know if there was a Mr. Woolgar. Um, she's very, uh, in the first book, Haley cannot find a way in at all. So little by little in each book, she's learning a little bit on, uh, more about Mrs. Woolgar. But of course, in, in uh, The Bodies in the Library, it's always a challenge. They're, daily briefings in the morning because she's afraid Mrs. Wilgar is going to mention an author or a character yes. or a storyline that she knows nothing about. So um, by book two, I, we're pushing it a little bit further. At least she knows who Dorothy L. Sayers is. I, that's one of the things I find so charming about Haley, actually. And I just think that it's it's very clever the balance that you've got there because she she's just an, a really lovely character and mm -hmm. I think too that you've managed to sort of like you know a lot about the golden age without sort of telling you too much about it so it's for the lay person who may not know that much about it it's um it's you're finding out along with Haley and I I really like that well and I I think I fall somewhere between an expert on the golden age of mystery yeah. and Haley on that continuum I'm saying but I did want to make sure that I thought it would be fun for people who knew a lot about the golden age of mystery to see these things mentioned and think oh I know that and then for people who didn't know very much about the authors and their stories um, to learn as Haley goes along and yeah. learns so um it's, I try to put in as much as possible. We do have, uh, we do have a cat, you know, we're, we're big on animals in Cozy Mysteries. And no, I have a cat my, in mine too. The cat, cat at Middlebank is Bunter, named after yeah. Lord Peter's uh, Batman. 
or ballot now. Um, and uh, and recurring characters. And yeah. that reminds me, I wanted to ask, well, actually, this is a comment. I, I had a comment about tidings of death at Honey Church Hall. Which oh, is, yes. The yes. Christmas story. Sort it's of. a Christmas story. Uh, and it's, I love having these recurring characters that may or may not show up in every single book, but they're always something. So I had a character in the first uh, book who is showing up again in the third one. He's not in the second. But I have to say, when David showed up in Tidings of Death and Honey, it makes me nervous when he shows up. Okay. Because I think that I don't want Kat to, you know... He's just like a, my dad would call him a bad smell that somehow he wouldn't quite go away, which <laughs> bless him. Um, but yes, the thing I do like about recurring characters is, is um, especially as I'm just about to start writing the eighth of the Honey Church book now, um, and because I had to put it to one side to focus on the other series, I'm I really am excited to get because I'm back with my friends again because I've known them for such a long time now. And so I'm doing just what you know mentioned there that um, one character may not be in one but like on the peripheral, and then I'll I'll spend more time on a secondary character in an, in another book, which is what I'm going to do with this new book I've started. Yeah. So well, I like and on the on the other hand, you know, I think I I asked readers once if it is a series and we do have these recurring characters the family you know or community of friends would you if someone doesn't have a really important role in a particular book book two book three book four whatever do you still want this person the friend of the friend to show up yes they always want you know i just want to know they're all right <laughs> yeah. no they really remember all the characters yeah 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 um, so. it's really it's nice actually and then but I still find, um, and I'm not sure whether you find the same, is that Honey Church when, in the first book was was just, I just, it was just the country estate, you know, with a few cottages and stuff. But as time has moved on, I've had to invent a village now that belongs to the estate. Yes. Um, it's like it's like the Hogwarts thing, the Harry Potter that just keeps getting <laughs> bigger and bigger. Yeah. Because otherwise I'm going to be stuck with Cabot Cur the Cabot Cove syndrome, where, you know, whoever's new to the area oh. is going to be. It's going to be murdered or the villain. It's very hard to get around that, actually. It, it, so, it is yeah. really. That's what I liked about uh, writing the Potting Shed series is because Prue was moving around a fair yeah. bit. So exactly. you know, it was. Right. But now, but now we are in Bath, and so um, you can, you know, it, it's you kind of wonder. Although often readers can figure out who the victim is just by reading the jacket blurb. <laughs> I know sometimes I'm hope sometimes I also find that some if there's too much given away because I I'm one of these people that never watch trailers for any movies or anything oh. <laughs> I I don't want to know what's going to happen I want to be surprised yeah so um yeah so there is it, it's tricky it's tricky actually yeah um yeah. so you have been to a question about the island sisters You've been to Tresco. I've never been, and I've heard fabulous things. Oh, it's so well, the interesting thing um, was that I, I did the proposal for it, and I wrote, I think I wrote maybe a couple of drafts, having never been there. So I did everything on Google, you know, Earth and all that, watched videos, read books. And then I thought, well, I really should go, actually. So I went with my sister, and we went there. And when I got there, it was nothing like I expected. Uh -huh. The actual, even though visually it was just as beautiful as I imagined, there was something about the essence of the island that I hadn't been able to feel by looking at things. It was a tangible sense of history, loads and loads of shipwrecks, because it used yeah. to be um, that all the galleons would go through to the new world. And so there was a real sense of, of real history there with you know the royalists in the English Civil War hid out there. Um, so I really, I really glad that I went there, and I absolutely love it. So um, it's it's a beautiful place. It's a pain to get to, though. It's really hard to get to. So you either have to fly, or you can fly, and then even when you get to the island, you oh they call well you can go by ferry because it's cheaper to go by ferry, mm -hmm. um, which is a two and a half hour ferry ride from England. So it's quite far out. Over but they waters. Over water, over, I think it's the Celtic and, yeah, it's where the Celtic Sea and the Atlantic are, you know, 
but they call it the great white stomach pump. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, because the boat is flat, a flat bottom boat. Oh. It's it's really grim. I even saw little dogs being sick, seasick on there. I know. So you don't want to go there. So we that just uh, crosses it off my list. <laughs> oh no, I know. Well, you can go by helicopter. So you, which is only fifteen minutes, but that's a bit pricey. That's the only thing I can imagine. Yeah. Well, of course, I always think about um, the gardens when I think about Tresco because we have oh, visited, the, oh the Abbey Gardens are it's gorgeous. A, that um, Gulf Stream that comes yes. up the west side there, and and we've seen the results of that up in Scotland and in Ireland as well. Yeah. When we visit gardens there, when I take tours around, and um, so the the tropical feel and uh, it does feel tropical actually. It has yeah. that. It does the smell of the flowers and everything, and, and the things yeah. that can be grown there, the plants that yeah. even. The Gulf Stream, even in Scotland, uh, on the uh, west coast, they can grow things on the west coast. Inland. Yeah, yeah. Where would where would be your favorite garden to visit up in west coast of Scotland? I I love the fact that you've done all these garden tours and stuff. Well, uh, the, it reminded me of Inverview. That was one of the gardens that we visited, and uh, it was where um, Mackenzie. I can't think of his first name. He he went and and when he got the land, planted trees all over, and then left for 20 years, <laughs> and then came back and the trees were grown. <laughs> so wow. um, yeah, it, it's a, the, the estates are lovely, but there are a lot of, we often um, choose uh, private gardens too, uh, under the NGS, the National Garden Scheme in England, or National Gardens for Scotland. Uh, where you can just, they're open maybe one day a year, but they'll open for small groups too. So we always are getting into private gardens. Victoria's Garden is open for the NGS. Oh, um, is it? Yeah. And, and yeah. So we had our, of course, the garden tour uh, that we scheduled for 2020 was in July in the Cotswolds. Mm -hmm. And we didn't go. But uh, our travel agent was able to reschedule for next July and the whole group has has kept with us. Oh, and that's great. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to being there again. That sounds incredible because I, I will say that one of the first books I read of yours, not knowing it was you, this is before I discovered you, was the Pacific Northwest Gardening books. Oh, yes. Oh, they're amazing because I'm not a gardener, but they were so, because I live, when I lived up in Portland and everything, and I just thought they were really great. I have them here in England. I mean, I know I'm not in England, but because the weather's sort of the same. It's, it is the same. That's true. Yeah. Isn't that funny? So um, you were an obituary writer and then you started writing a mystery series with an obituary writer and I was a garden writer and then I started right. writing a mystery series with a gardener. Yeah, if we write what you know, kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. How fun. Yeah. Well, um, I can you, even though, what's the name of the book after Tidings of Death at Honey Church? Oh, um, De Death of a something. Death of a Diva. Death of a Diva. This yeah. has just come out, but now it seems that you can, it's already available as an audio, an ebook rather, even though it doesn't come out until March. Yes, it come out, it'll come out in March for for sure here. But for what, sure, yeah. what's the storyline? Give us a little oh, time. Um, well, it's actually I had a lot of fun with this one because um, it's a set. The the backdrop is um, opera. It's the Merry Widow, mm. and so I had to go and do a little bit of research on that. So it's basically about um, a former villager, of course, because I have to keep it who grew up on the Honeychurch Hall estate below stairs because, you know, the, these big families still exist, by the way, with their staff, but there just aren't as many of them. Yeah. Um, and she went off to Italy to become a very famous um, opera singer and she's come back. Um, and so, um, you know, she comes back and she creates a lot of, of havoc. Now she's doing one more, one more performance. She's in her 60s and... Um, there's all sorts of murder and mayhem that gets connected to that in the ballroom, in the ballroom. And I, I had a, I had a thing about um, the great horseshoe bat. It's <laughs> the bat because in Devon we have, well, they're all, I think they're all, all over the country, but the horseshoe bat is the one that really does hang upside down yeah. as opposed to the little pipperdell. Mm. I think they're called pipperell, pipperell, pipperell. I don't know, they're little tiny ones. 
Um, and so I, I did a lot of research on bats as well. And mm. that was very interesting. You so, never know what you're going to have to look up. <laughs> I know. I know so I mean, it's funny what you start to learn about, you know, it's like, oh yeah, I know all about bats. It's like, really? Yeah. So, um, but um, yeah, so that was, um, that was fun. I enjoyed writing that. And um, then, yes. Yeah, so um, that was, I, that was set actually in the ballroom, which of course, mm. admitting I've already had the great hall in one of my other books and then I thought oh god I'm gonna have to use the ballroom because the great hall wouldn't have fit the story by the way I described it it was the wrong side and everything so then I had to have a wing that no one had been in for years and it had the ballroom in it so so that's why I'm saying it's like Hogwarts as I say it's another oh it's another wing yes oh, that's right yeah it's like creating the Charlotte for the exhibition space in Murder is a Must um, I'm sure that I, well, I mentioned the assembly rooms in the bodies in the library, but the, you know, I'm, we're walking up and down the assembly room. Haley goes in the cafe. It's where she meets Una Atherton, who um, becomes yeah. the exhibition manager, um, uh, even though Una frightens Haley. Um, and she frightens me too, actually. She's, she's <laughs> but I'm, I'm very happy to have uh, an actual map of Bath that I can look at and decide, well, I'll use this or I'll, you know, squeeze this in there. I, I just finished, when I finished book three, I realized I had one of the um, booksellers in Bath, uh, George Bankton. I've made a big deal about them uh, in the third book. And I thought, I probably should email them and say, oh, by the way, because they're real. They're just- oh, a, They would like that. I'm sure they'd I love just, it. I just realized another change I made in Bath. Now I, um, we, you know, we both read lots of other mysteries and I've read several of Peter Lovesey's books, the Peter yes, Cooley books, and they are set in Bath, uh, but that's a police procedural. So, you know, yeah, it's yeah, a little yeah, bit different yeah. there. Uh, and when, um, when the police uh, uh, areas, regions got consolidated, um, Peter Lovesey, just as he was supposed to, moved Peter Diamond to, I think the building is some up near Bristol, is where the center is now. Uh, oh, yes, it is actually. Yeah, yeah. But, but you know what? I needed a police station in Bath. And so yeah. it's yeah, on exactly. Denver Street. It's just up from the, uh, it is where it was, just up from the rail station. And it's now called the One Stop Shop, where I think you can get a license and do this and do that. Oh, yes. For me, it's still it, the police station. Yeah, so. you have to have a police station. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, because you have to have, and here, this, this is interesting. And I think that you've done this too. I don't know who made this up, but people keep referring to um, the police in mis traditional and, and cozy mysteries as, oh, the bumbling, you know. Oh, sorry. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't have that. We, we treat our police with respect. Yeah. I mean, I know you have, a, well, you do have a very interesting policeman in your, no, I won't say anything more about that, but um oh. Sean, oh, yeah. Sean, is that God, right? Sean with his ties and the train train spotting stuff. Um, yeah, but I, yeah, think... I, I, I want them to be, um, yes, sometimes it's difficult to handle that if you haven't got them dating a detective, because a lot of the cozy mysteries, you've got the protagonist, the serial I mean, killer. Have you, is that, but Val's she not. She married the oh, detective. Because okay, I suddenly thought, wait a second, no, Val's not, no, because no, I was, no. was having a mental moment for a moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so because then that's always very convenient, isn't it? It's lucky because that's what's basically happening in my honey church. You yeah, know? yeah, um, but that's true. You have to find ways. But I, I mean, I, I like the um, all of the detectives in all of my series, and I, Sergeant Detective Sergeant Hopgood and Detective Constable Kenny Pye, and in, in the first yeah. edition library series, I really like them. They're, they're different. I think they're kind of a good contrast to, as a duo. You know, it's. I don't know, yeah. Lewis and Hathaway, Morris and Lewis. Yeah, um, I, I did have something really, um, really cool that happened when I did go to Tresco that I think it was my second time in Tresco. Um, and it so happened, I was introduced to a couple who were just on vaca vacation there. And it turned out that he was head of the homicide department for the whole of Devon and Cornwall. And he was there on, um, I think he was there on a sort of like, He'd been given a free kind of few days because um, he'd been helping somebody investigate something. And so now he's almost become my new best friend. 
and he loves telling me all the stories. So it's like, I mean, I can go to lunch with him. I just buy him lunch. Well, you you know, when you could. Um, and it's it's just his whole his eyes light up as he tells me all these things that happen. Um, yeah, but they're quite gory though. So I I have to be careful because we can't write about gore in the cozy world. I mean, it's it's violent, but you don't see it's happening. You don't see it happening. That's right. You yes, thank goodness. No, I'm I'm not interested in that. I don't mind. But you know, the funny thing is, I mean. Even of course we lot we watch a lot of British television here because oh, we Brit Box yeah. and Acorn we watch all the detective shows well not all of them we still haven't caught up with all of them but um, even in uh, even in Anne Cleves even if yeah, in Vera or in Shetland violence happens but you don't usually see it you see the body floating in the water you right know? exactly yeah it's, it's not blood all over the table but you don't see it happening. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. Um, now I we let's move on to our surprise questions. But oh yeah, yes, I, you do. I will. I will answer one first, and then I will ask you the same question. This is how I. This is how oh. I get to it because <laughs> inevitably, yeah. authors and readers start talking about who would you cast as okay. whoever in your in your mysteries now. You know, I had some ideas for my first two mysteries, but I thought about this, the first edition library series, and I can't think of an actor that I would, that I can see in any part. And I, I was trying to, mostly I was trying to think of Mrs. Woolgar today. <laughs> Maybe you have a suggestion for that. But I will tell you that um, Val, the character of Val was greatly inspired by Mark Bonner. Oh, really? Oh, really? Okay. Hey, yeah. So that's my only um, actor for uh, in a role. Do you what have about Haley though? What about Haley? Oh, I don't. Do you have somebody that you'd like to? See? I have to. Um, I started doing this a few books back, where I would spend ages finding a photograph of my, every character that's like of the main group, yeah. the first, the six or something, um, and it could even be a friend or a family member or someone like that. Yeah. And so, um, because then I keep the pictures so that I can, somehow I feel I can connect with that. Yeah. So I do, for the main characters, I, I definitely have um, as Kat Stanford, which is my antique dealer in um, Honeychurch Tall. Um, I don't know, I can't, I don't, her name's Tams and Grieg, I think. And she was in um, episodes, do you know? I think she's also in Belgravia, which is this new oh, which yeah. I haven't watched yet. Yeah. Um, but so yeah so I like her she's not sort of traditionally pretty or anything and but she's very sensible and then um, I always loved Diane Lane I thought she was so adorable but my Evie in Island Sisters because she's very gentle Evie's yeah. very gentle so wow. yeah so I have some fun with that and then but then it's I, it's just I'm just putting off writing. I'm just playing for hours. <laughs> well, but you know, it's funny. There, there are quite a few characters that, of course, that I've based, and I know you do this too, on on real people that you know. Absolutely, but, yeah. But um, that some that you may never see again in uh, uh, Midsummer Mayhem, the um, last potting shed to come out. It was about uh, an outdoor production of A Midsummer Night's Dream that Prue was helping with the set. For. And the director of the play was directly based on the man who was the head of the drama department at New Mexico State University. Oh. I started there in drama. Herschel Zone was his name. That's not his name in my book. And though the actress in Midsummer Mayhem that plays Titania in yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. was based on the student I remembered playing Titania in our production of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Occasionally, you know, they just spring up and you have I to. Do, yeah, I definitely do that to start with, I think, because once you throw a murder in, they're going to react not like your friend That's or right. the person you and they're different. Yes. But I did have in my Vicky Hill, um, there was a, a friend who I won't mention her name. Um, and she was like Vicky's nemesis, ne a frenemy. Uh -huh. So she was like her nemesis. and someone she didn't get on with very well. And she was she was pretty annoying, actually. And her name's Annabelle Lake in the book. Um, and then this particular friend of mine read Vicky Hill and she said, can I tell you my favorite character? It's Annabelle Lake. I just love her. And she didn't know that she was based on <laughs> Annabelle Lake. 
Well, so, but she didn't see herself. She didn't see herself. Was, that was very interesting. Yeah. But well, that was good. I disguised that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. In my Birds of a Feather series, uh, I have, there's a baker, Nula, uh, who owns the tea shop, and she's a wonderful baker in the village. And I based her exactly on a dear friend of mine who is American, but I met her when I was living in Dublin. She was living in Dublin there too. And she's now living in Florida. It's Susan O'Gara. I will tell you her name. And I told Susan, I said, "Want it because she's read all my books. I, you know, you're in the Birds of a Feather series. I am, she said. I said, yes. She, she I, I described her perfectly. Tall, thin, short, curly black hair with a little threaded with silver. She could eat anything in the world and never gain weight. And she moved like a dancer. She was in the theater too. So this is something else we have in common. And I thought, to, I can look at Nula's description and just see Susan like that. And see, she has never been able to see herself that way. Uh, Isn't that funny? And also, you're never going to kill her off, of it, clearly. I am she never going to kill Nula off. Yeah, she, yeah. she makes a really good chocolate cake, so. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, let's get our priorities right here. That's so funny, yeah. So, um, wow. so gosh, we're ramping along, actually, aren't we? I'm just on the I here's Hello. I I Hello. <laughs> away actually <laughs> so let's do a couple questions it's you know it's i hate to interrupt you guys but you know i know we're just carrying on <laughs> i love it i was sitting there in front of you just chatting away <laughs> um let's see so roxanne asks marty when you take your garden tours do you include any writing do i write when i'm on the garden tour roxanne i think maybe that is that what she's asking or do i get inspiration from <laughs> <laughs> it says, do you include any writing? Do I do write? When we're on our tours or when we're just in England um, staying there, I'm always jotting something down, even if I'm not, you know, writing a whole scene or something, because you never know when you're going to be inspired and you need to get this down. Well, I, I have a notebook. I carry a notebook. I write it in my laptop or on scraps of paper. We're big on scraps of paper in this house. <laughs> Words written on scraps of paper. So um, it it is, I will often, I will overhear, oh, we're terrible eavesdroppers, authors are. And, you know, I can overhear uh, an exchange on a tour, could be people on the tour, sorry folks, but you know, you're fair game, um, or in a cafe or in a garden. And uh, I remember, to a, an older couple at Sissinghurst coming up to this uh, pot, a big stone pot in the back of the house. And uh, the man said, oh, the woman said, oh, we have that one and the plant. And he said, oh, do we? I thought it died. No, the other one died. Oh yes, you're right. And off they went, <laughs> you know, no. I just grab these little things when I can, yes. Yeah, that's exactly it. And I, I eavesdropped on a, um, a a couple in a pub. One and this guy was a hedge jumper, and that was how I one of my Vicky Hill crazy customs. Um, and they actually subsequently got divorced apparently because um, he would drive around the English countryside looking for hedges that he could just throw himself into. It was very strange. <laughs> But anyway, I know there are other questions. I just I, got- I didn't know that was the thing. Hedge jumpers. So I had to wear moleskin trousers and all that kind oh, of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Because, uh, anyway. That is too funny. I've never heard of this practice, but no, you know. <laughs> so, oh, it looks like Roxanne Dunn um, expanded on the question a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so does the group write on the garden tours? Oh, ha, yeah, this is what our travel agent has everyone do because he's always with us. He's a great tour director because when we're on the tours, I, it doesn't help for people to come up to me and say, there's a leak in my hotel room. Brad, mm. you know, if they want to say, what tree is that? Then I'll answer their question. But um, we do write on the tours because Brad has everyone write a haiku at the end of the tour. And on our last that. dinner together we, or on on the coach one or the other people start reading off their haikus and i've got oh, to say, yeah, my my husband wins almost every time it, he, he'll have two or three haikus they're fabulous oh, that's, that's a great idea. idea that is a good idea so i mean i have a few questions well you guys you know audience i'm watching you 
mm. come up with something. <laughs> but um, so a quick selfish question: What are you guys reading? Oh, I always love to know. I have a stack of books that I have recently purchased from third place (laughs) Uh, and, and they're keeping me going. So I um, read the latest uh, John Rebus in Rankin book and um, I have the constant rabbit on my desk here because I love Jasper Ford. Jasper Ford is the author of the, the Thursday next series. And I always have to say this because people just look at you like you're insane when you, the Thursday Next series uh, involves a, a police detective in the book division of, of the police. And in The Air Affair, the first book, it's about the time when Jane Eyre was kidnapped out of her book. Oh, <laughs> so oh I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to The Constant Rabbit. And I also have The Thursday Murder Club. Have you heard of that? Oh, yeah, I have heard of that. Yeah, yeah. I have heard of that. Mm-hmm. On my, on my uh, stack there. Yeah. Yeah, I have I have a very big big stack of books. I mean, the last book I read was um, "Murder Must." Uh, Murder is a must. Your book, <laughs> the one I just read. This I just finished yeah. that, um, and I just ordered um, "On Deadly Tides," which is one of Elizabeth Duncan's books. Uh, Penny ba- Penny Brannigan yeah. and Elizabeth in Wales. Um, and so yeah, so I'm really excited about that. I'm, that will be my next book to read and in the interim I'm rereading um Marnie Kellogg Davis or is it Marnie Davis Kellogg um brilliant um I liked her books too she I don't think she writes anymore actually I don't know she wrote about five five books about this uh jewel thief um so I'm, I enjoy her books because that the heroine is like an anti-heroine yeah. so it makes it great. so yeah I, so those are my three I am also reading some books by Elizabeth Cadell who oh, wrote yeah. in the 50s. Oh, yeah. yeah and I, I'm trying I to reread the books from the 50s. I do know who it is. Yes, I actually have read one of those recently. Yeah. I, I, I really enjoy them, um, but they're all mostly out of print. So I'm getting them from the library. But then I ran across Verily Anderson's book called Spam Tomorrow, which is a memoir of the war. And I did get that at third place as well. It's a reprint. And it's... So at the time when the book came out, a reviewer said, this book is bizarre. And it is. <laughs> I'm not really Verily Anderson. Yeah, that will be. Sorry, I'm writing all these things down at the same yeah. time. I've got paper. Good. Uh, oh, I'm linking them in the description too. So. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see. Rather than a question, this is from Kathleen. A huge thank you for transporting me back to Bath, Tresco, Devon, Edinburgh, (laughs) and all the villages, theaters, teas, and strolls that I visited in the lovely long ago. My tea, my term for our precious pre COVID memory bank. Yeah, that's really lovely. (laughs) Speaking of COVID. Um, has COVID affected the writing process in any unexpected ways? Uh, it, ways, it, bad ways? <laughs> it, it did meet us the first time it did. In March, it did. I found it very difficult. Um, it took me forever to write the second book in the Island Sisters Mysteries, which is out next year. Um, I really struggled with that. It was very strange, um, but it don't, didn't really affect my actual life because all I do is write and walk my dog so in that respect I'm very unsocial um but yes I think I think it it, it feels very everything feels a little bit unsafe still yeah. it it affected my writing process in that um I normally write at the library or in the comments. Oh, oh yes, you have to say my books. books. Yeah. And so <laughs> because I know that all those are not quiet places. Libraries are no longer quiet places. But the noise around me, it had nothing to do with me. So I could always concentrate. So with everything locked down and closed, um, I found I, I still was having trouble. I'm better now. I can write in in my little office here. In, indoors. But uh, what I did all through the spring and summer is I would go out to the car every morning. I know you have to shut up <laughs> and write. And I would come back in, get a cup of coffee, go back out again. I'd be there two, two and a half hours. Um, and that's how, and I write in the morning anyway. And at, not long after I started it, um, I came back in and Leighton said, was somebody in the car with you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
I was sitting in the passenger seat, right? <laughs> because there's no room there. And he thought, well, who else is out there? That's so, pretty funny. That didn't work very well. That got me to um, my deadline for the historical fiction that's coming out in January, Glamour Girls. I turned that in the end of March. And then I finished um, the third book in the first edition library series, turned that in at the beginning of September. So I've been writing up until the last couple of weeks, uh, I have been out in the car. So I, I thought, okay, now, if I just make a few little alterations in my little office here, then the cats are still around, but it, you know, they're mostly beside the heater. <laughs> I can concentrate a little bit more inside now. Car writing. That's a new answer. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> so it looks like we're getting right up to the end of our time, but I would love to hear what the next project for you guys is. What, what should we look out for? Um, sorry, my dog's, he suddenly got, ah, yes. um, <laughs> I've, I've just started my eighth book called, um, murder in miniature, or is it miniature murder, murder in miniature at Honeychurch Hall. And that is due in June. So I've literally just started it on the 1st of December because I just turned in a book on the 30th of November. So it's a bit like Marty, it's always like close to the wire. And then as always, I'm always trying to write another book that is on spec. You know, it's a standalone and um, I, one day, I don't know if I'll ever get around to writing it, but I keep chipping away. That's so that's <laughs> um, So the, the next book to appear is uh, Glamour Girls, January 12th. And I'm very excited about that. Uh, and that is set in England during World War II. And it's my first historical fiction, first standalone. Uh, it's about... Uh, one of the women ferry pilots. So she flew spitfires and hurricanes all over England and Scotland, uh, delivering them to RAF bases. And it's this, it's the story of her life at, through the war. And I had such a wonderful time um, writing that. And so I started researching my next historical fiction, which is a standalone as well. It's kind it's so different. I, you know, Hannah different, started with yeah. you know, it's such a different feeling writing one book and yeah. having that be it and then having a whole other new idea. So that's what I'll be working on. Well, wonderful. Thank you guys so much for coming in and discussing. I've loved being a fly on the wall in here. Um, <laughs> everyone else who appeared, thank you so much for being here and um, come buy books. Come on in, we're still open if you're local. Uh, and thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Allie. Thank you, Have Allie. a good evening thank or day, much. whichever it is. Bye. <laughs> bye. 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 Bye, Hannah. Bye, bye, Marty. Bye. <laughs>